Good afternoon, good evening, um, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank you for attending uh, my talk on Private Terra Report from the Field. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity first before anything to thank uh, you for attending this uh, session um, and also the Chaos Computer Club um, and their supporters to making it possible for me to present uh, to you today. Um, over the course of the, the, the hour that I have with you, um, I'm going to do, um, I'm going to speak about the work that Private Terra uh, is involved in, uh, give you a little bit of history, um, but do this in a very interactive, uh, visual way as well. So instead of just speaking um, about what we've done is actually show you some pictures and uh, we'll really want some, some input from the community here as well. So first of all, uh, my name is Robert Guerra. I'm the Managing Director of Private Terra. Um, and for the talk today, uh, these are the, the key points that I'm going to talk about. Uh, first of all is uh, just to give you a little bit of background on um, Private Terra, uh, how it got started, what is it, um, the type of projects that we've done, um, the type of things that we do. Uh, when I talk about uh, working in the field, uh, what that means, uh, what is the field. Um, the security workshops that we do, um, I'll give you a view of what that is um, and answer and show you a couple of questions. Uh, what's there in the field? What can be done? Uh, remembering the context. Um, something about uh, secret archives. Um, some lessons learned and questions and answers. Um, what's more important is, first of all, is just telling you an idea what, what Private Terra is. Um, Private Terra comes as a result of uh, some individuals, including myself, back in 2000, um, who very much were participating in privacy discussions, security and crypto discussions, both online and in conferences. And we saw that there was a lot of discussion about human rights. There's a lot of discussions about helping people who, who work with human rights uh, with secure uh, communications. This is right after the discussions uh, related to the clipper chip, uh, to whether encryption is legal or not in the United States and other countries. Um, and there was some work that was originally being done um, by the American Association for the Advancement of Science and others uh, to try to get some human rights organizations, people who work with human rights, people who, who work um, whose information needs protecting um, to, to have some technical assistance. And so it was really the one or two individuals that were doing this, and we thought, well, it might be a good idea to try to bring some set of people to help this. Uh, and we thought, instead of just talking about it, what is it that we could do to develop a specific project, to, spe to develop a specific set of things that we could do to, to bring the ideas, to bring the tools of security, of privacy, um, and technology to some human rights organizations, but also to get from them what their context is, what their environment is, what's happening to them, seeing how those tools are used, what are some of the problems, and feeding that back into the, the community, such as yours, but others as well. But more importantly is because in some of the environments, uh, countries are very repressive, there's a lot of surveillance. Are there things that we could learn from those environments that then get fed into uh, the discussions around policy, the discussions around protests, are there arguments that we can use from other countries? And so we had this idea, um, what did we do? Well, first of all is we started talking to colleagues and to organizations to see what could be done, what could be set up, and to some um, uh, organizations that could support us as well too. Um, one of the first meetings um, was in around 2000, uh, meeting with the cypherpunk community uh, based in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area um, because there are some individuals there who had been interested in crypto, who talked about human rights just to get their input as well too. Uh, to also activist community as well too. This was the same time of the Dmitry Sklirov case, which is this case of this Russian programmer who um, built some code and, and talked about a security fault uh, in the Adobe Reader and was arrested at, at the DEF CON conference. And we also spoke to some of the people who were involved in defending Dimitri and others to see, can we take some of this energy that's there, the interest that people have, um, and try to bring that to, to a specific project? And also at different conferences that some of us participated at the time, um, are there people there that were interested as well? So how could we bring these different communities together? And so from my home in Toronto, which is like here, full of a lot of snow, 
and spending a lot of time online, virtually, trying to get different uh, people together, um, try to develop what are some specific tasks, uh, a mission for the organization that we could do. Um, to make it into very simple things that we could try to do and then try to get some, uh, some results. So we basically broke it down into three main things that we wanted to do, is training. Um, are there specific tools that we could show? Are there specific knowledge that we would have about security that we could help organizations with? And so the first thing was, are there basic concepts that maybe we understand uh, really, really well, but others just don't? And are, could we help organizations with that? Could we help them with secure communications tools? At the time, PGP um, was very popular and still is. Are there other set of tools that we could help people with if they just don't have a manual or have never heard of the tool? Um, and then what is it that we could use for these organizations to collaborate to, to use them uh, online? Um, then are there ways, as I said, that we could bring some of this knowledge that these uh, and the experience of working with these people back to the community? and um, put that as well into the advocacy community as well, too. The projects that we've done since 2000, and I'll show you some of the pictures very shortly, is um, we've worked almost in all the continents so far, in Africa, in Central Asia, in Kazakhstan, uh, some places in Europe, particularly in Latin America, uh, and Southeast Asia most recently as well, and have also spoken with the press as well, too. Spoken them. Uh, what particular things have we, have we done when, we, when, we, when I say that we've done some activities? Uh, we've spoken with individuals, we've spoken with organizations to see what is it that they would need, uh, just have a discussion with them. Um, but also when we talk about tools, we talk about teaching, um, it's getting some of the, the language that's used at these conferences, so it, and in other places as well too. If we talk about encryption algorithms, uh, 1024 tool for eight size key. Does this mean anything to an average user who just cares about um, bringing a criminal to justice? They don't. Um, they just want to get their things done. So, um, you know, what is it that we would have to adjust in terms of the language? Or do they have a technical person who was really interested in those things? So those are some of the things that we tried to do um, in terms of the, the methods that we tried to use. Uh, focusing that we're, we're talking about different cultures in Latin America uh, is very different than working in the United States. In the United States, some organizations want you to come, and do the training, and leave. And organizations in Latin America, you have to spend some time with them before, get to know how the organization works. You have to start building trust with them, and then stay some time with them as well, too. So they really have a sense of um, that you're there not just as a foreigner who wants to go, but to actually give them some knowledge, give them some, some tools, so they can help themselves. Um, and so that's th the approach that we try to do. And again, uh, teach them some, some basic knowledge around the internet and security. So for example, one of the questions that is maybe very obvious to a lot of people here is how the internet works, how email works, how the web works. Um, a lot of organizations that, that we help both in, in, in Europe, in North America, and in, and in South America, have misconceptions on how the internet works. Haven't really had that explained to them. And if you're gonna talk about security, if you're gonna talk about vulnerabilities, that is a very key thing that needs to be discussed first. And so we, uh, we, we do that, and we spent some time as well, too. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take you through a visual tour. I've spoken for almost 10 minutes, um, and because it's towards the end of the day, uh, let's try to spice up, up with, with some pictures. So in terms of some of the workshops that we do, it really depends on the type of organization and the, the, the type of need. Uh, sometimes it's just an organization, it's a, it's a particular uh, worker in the field that says, I need training because I'm gonna be sent to um, somewhere in Africa or I'm gonna be sent to, to Russia. I need to collect some information. I need to send it back to, to, to London. I need to send it back to Berlin. And I know that there's surveillance. What is it that you can do or someone can do to help me? And so we'll do individualized training. We might also help a small group of people as well. So when we talk about one-to-one, -one, it could be one person or a group of people that we work with. Um, that's kind of symbolic. Um, what, it, what it means sometimes in some context is, depending on the technology that's available, it really is a workshop that's outside. 
if you want to explain how the internet works and you have no power and you have no internet, it can be a bit of a challenge. And so if you put a sheet of paper, you get some colored markers, um, you can be really creative and people can really quite understand. Um, in some of the places that we've gone, in some of the places where there's real issues in terms of um, uh, violence, in terms of ongoing conflict, it's really difficult to get to a place. Um, some of you who have maybe flown to Berlin uh, might have the picture of the airport when you arrived. It's probably very different than that, this airport. And that's the type of airport that you might find when you travel to places. And so if the conditions aren't right, if it's raining too much, uh, you just can't land. Or maybe on the way to the airport, um, it's rained and your car gets stuck. Um, or maybe you need to leave because um, there's going to be a military convoy on the way. And so it's not easy to do. Uh, and it's also the people, if they're attending an event somewhere, this is the travel that they have to do. So it can be quite a challenge. Um, some places, uh, like this one, this was in, in Eastern Congo, are in a constant state of uh, armed conflict. If you, any of you follow the news, you might see that there was a, a UN soldiers were sent into Eastern Congo just maybe a week or so ago, just, just before Christmas. And so some places are really problematic. Um, this is an event that we did about a year ago. Um, we really wanted to train people there because they know the conditions really well. Um, we don't want to necessarily put people who don't know the conditions at risk. Um, and so this is just to give you an idea. Uh, in terms of traveling, um, again, it can be really complicated. It can be really dangerous to travel some of the places. Um, but what's very important is to really get a sense of an understanding of where you're traveling and what the conditions are. Um, as you may have seen in the, the talk just previous in regards to, to New Orleans and Iraq, the issue of, of understanding how changes occur. And so an example in point, a situation that happened to us when, when we were in Congo, is we were just in the middle of the street, um, just um, at a, at a visiting the internet cafe, and we see a UN armed vehicle drive by. And so is this a good thing? Are they just driving by? Um, is it that there's a problem? Um, all we know is that uh, the problem is with young men, usually with guns, um, is when you have to be careful. Well, first we see this, and then we see uh, men with flags making a lot of noise, some in military fatigues, and so we start to get really afraid. Um, what is it that we do? Um, and the person that's local with us says, no, 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 it's, it's no problem, you, you know, just watch. And so those of us who aren't familiar with the context are really afraid and don't know what to do. And so then we see motorcycles come. And again, a lot of people making a lot of noise. Um, it, it can be right problematic. But then at the end, we realize um, it's not a protest. It's not some military takeover. It just happens to be the birthday of Bob Marley. And Bob Marley is someone who is really appreciated in this part of Africa, and the flags that they were was the Jamaican flag, and that's why they were waving. But at first, we didn't know. And so the importance of, of really having people who are local really help out in these type of conditions is really, really important. And that's uh, anyone that's interested in, in doing any of this type of work, that's a point that I, I really want to stress. Getting into, again, some specific uh, pictures of different things that we've done, I'll go to show just some pictures of a workshop we did in Kazakhstan, Russia, and in Latin America. Now, Kazakhstan is a country um, that some of you may, may be able to place on a map. Uh, it's a very uh, oil-rich country uh, that's uh, just north of, um, almost north of Afghanistan. There's a country in between. Former uh, Soviet Republic, um, uh, speak Russian or speak Kazakh. Um, and uh, there was a, a, a funder uh, who wanted to organize a, a workshop for uh, technology people uh, and activists in, in that region. And so I, I don't speak Russian. And so we had to find trusted translators. Um, and we also had to find places to do um, the event. And so when we arrived, we find this very huge, um, what's called a hotel now. Uh, it was apparently a hotel for the Communist Party um, when Kazakh. Kazakhstan was part of the Soviet Union. And um, so what do you do if you want to connect to the internet? Um, is there internet? Is there dial-up? Uh, because it was uh, owned and run by the Communist Party. Um, is there surveillance built in? 
um, we really don't know. Um, and then you go inside, and you can find that there's computers and maybe a classroom. And so at what you think at first glance can be uh, deceptive. Um, the, the problem that we had here is that they had such a tight firewall, um, but their technical person wasn't in. And so no open SSH ports, nothing, and there was no one that could help us. And so we had the technology, and we had to spend some time um, just doing some explanations uh, with a translator. Um, at, at another uh, training there as well, too, people spend a lot of time working on some of the problems or in some of the tools that we showed them. Um, and again, as you can see from the previous picture, some people are old, some people are young, and that's another thing that you have to do is, um, as well, too, is when you work with organizations, there's a difference in the understanding of the technology. Uh, you might be able to teach young people uh, very quickly, but to teach someone that's maybe 70, 80 years old, um, they have habits that are very hard to change. And so it's, it's, it's quite a challenge that way as well, too. Um, as I mentioned earlier, some of our work has been um, in South America, and one of the two countries um, that we've done most of our work, uh, one is Colombia. Uh, this is a, a picture of uh, Bogota, um, a city of six million uh, people. And there we, we, we worked with, with different human rights organizations, uh, visited different organizations to see um, how they were using technology, um, give them some idea in terms of um, what suggestions they could implement, but also conducted a couple of workshops. Um, and here you see um, a picture of uh, kind of the type of people that you find in the classroom, uh, kind of a mixture of, of men and women. Um, and here you see one of the, the, the women participants um, actually organizing um, you know, one of the exercises, so just trying to get some feedback with her fellow students as well, too. Um, the other thing as well is we also uh, did some work in, in Peru, um, just uh, very close to Colombia as well, too. Uh, there we work with the uh, coordinator of human rights. Um, where there's a, been a very uh, strong campaign, a very long campaign um, to, uh, for, for many things, but a, a very priority cause that was going on at the time and still is now, is to extradite uh, Alberto Fujimori, who was uh, the, the president uh, several years ago, uh, who then left, uh, of Japanese or origin, who then left uh, Peru when some of the financial problems were being discovered, went to Japan, said, I'm a Japanese citizen, and because Japan has no extradition treaty with, uh, with any country, um, if you're a Japanese citizen, uh, Japan wouldn't um, give him up to any country. Um, he very recently uh, visited, I think it was um, Chile, and Chile and um, Peru do have an extradition treaty, so they're in the process of trying to take this gentleman to trial um, in Peru. And when we were there, we worked with groups like Amnesty International and others, um, to uh, tell them about some of the security issues uh, and to do some, some training as well, too. So there we had a, a colleague um, uh, from Lima. Uh, here there's a picture of her uh, working with uh, someone from Amnesty and showing them how uh, email encryption works and how one of the plugins uh, works for, for Pegasus Mail. Uh, any questions so far? Have you ever worked with organizations you later found out you should not or you, you would not work with again? Because um, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that there is a gray area between just um, opposition work and then, well, other. That's a, that's a very good question. And that was during the, the process of, of finding out uh, how we would work and with the type of organizations that we would work with is how to select partners, but how to deal with that problem. And so one of the things that we did, and the reason why some of our work has taken a long time to do, is that it's really through, um, through a network that we try to uh, pick partners. So right now, if an organization approaches us and says, you know, we, we've heard about you, um, we're working in, um, in the US, uh, we have this issue with the FBI, can you help us? Um, what we do is we say, you know, we try to get an understanding of what some of their problems are, and then ask, 
uh, groups like Amnesty or Human Rights Watch and others, have they worked with them before? And so it's really through a, a reference network. What we try to stay away from is, um, we try to stay with known human rights organizations um, because they tend to collect information and send it sometimes out of the country as well. So it's really easy to check on the individuals or particularly the, the organization. Um, so far, we haven't run into um, an individual or organization that we've actually trained that um, maybe a year later we say, oh, we made a mistake. Um, but my response to the law enforcement question that we've not been asked yet is what if law enforcement asks us, well, why are you doing this and don't you know that this um, organization is illegal? Um, the one place where this is uh, the case now is in Kazakhstan. The, the foundation that, that got us to teach to the network has now been outlawed by the government and all the people expelled. So I believe that if we go back, we might be jailed. Um, when I've been asked in Canada, I basically say, well, we're just teaching the same tools that banks use um, and the same type of methodology. So we don't, um, we don't get into very covert. We just use very available tools. Um, and so we haven't run into that. We're just very careful in terms of who we select um, and who we work with. Um, the picture that you have here, it's a very good question though, and one that uh, anyone who would like to work in this has to really deal with that problem because if you do select someone, it might also implicate you as well too. Uh, so then you can get on lists and, and not be able to travel. I know of other colleagues who um, have worked with um, environmental organizations, um, and s particularly in the U.S., and uh, they are on the fly list. So whenever they travel in the U.S., they always get searched now. Um, but this is also the case of university professors that have worked with some things as well, too. Um, so, um, but a good question. Uh, this next uh, photograph is uh, one of Guatemala City, uh, one where we've um, visited probably about eight times over the last uh, uh, four years and where we Primatera really started most of its work. It was because uh, there was an organization there uh, who found out about some of the work that uh, we were uh, doing in the United States that knew we spoke Spanish as well uh, to say, look, we, we need some training. Uh, we do some um, workshops for security for, for human rights organizations. Can you come and give a, a, a two-day lecture on... Um, just tools and things that you think might be important. Um, the, you'll see another picture soon, but it's a, it's a city that uh, the buildings aren't usually more than 10 stories high, um, because I think it was in 76 or in 80, um, there was a very strong earthquake that almost flattened the whole city, so it's very earthquake prone. Uh, the current capital, Guatemala City, uh, is the new capital. The, the, the previous capital um, in the 18th century was uh, flattened by um, an earthquake, Antigua, Guatemala. Um, and so it's one that, um, it's a very interesting country, uh, one, because it has um, a lot of um, volcanoes and things like that, so it's very pretty. It has a very sad um, history um, because its um, government was overthrown by uh, one planted by the U.S. Um, and um, the, the level of violence was, um, was just, whoops, Uh, was just uh, uh, terrible. Uh, one of the, uh, the interesting things uh, about um, Guatemala is um, the, the resilience of the, the people. And this is one of the things that uh, hearing the talk yesterday in terms of that we've lost the war, um, that we have to uh, give up, uh, that there's nothing more that we can do. Um, a country like this had a, a, a military dictatorship that, that lasted many years. Um, there were huge atrocities and war crimes c uh, committed against the people, but the people did not give up. And uh, when the situation was right, um, you know, they've, they've, they've been able to do a lot of things. So the, the one message that, that I, the one gets when, when working in the field is one should not give up. I mean, there are going to be very bad times. There are times when you think that uh, you have nothing left, that you will uh, maybe lose um, uh, many rights, but um, there still have to be people that 
uh, that stay uh, that stay engaged and that try to uh, to do their um, their best. Um, getting to to one of the workshops that were there, this is one of the, the first ones. Uh, you can see in the background um, the very first time we did a workshop there, um, we, we did two. So the first one is we tried to be a little bit technical because the um, the, the round of conversations that we had with people is that um, they were technical, that they use computers, and we thought, okay, uh, we're going to um, explain to them what um, different type of encryption algorithms are like. Uh, we're going to spend uh, a day and a half on, on theory, on, on different encryptions about public key cryptography. And halfway through the first day, uh, we realized that when they said that they were technical, um, that meant very different um, that what, what we thought being technical. And um, the, the colleague that was helping me at the time, um, as you can see in the background, um, all the, the notes on the back are all in English. Of course, the people there don't speak English, they speak Spanish. And so it was a big challenge for them to um, understand what was being said, even though it was being translated, um, because they would want it in their own language. And one of the first um, things that we learned very quickly is um, in the country, it's better if you can actually do the presentation in their own language. And so maybe spend time, train someone who knows a local language because they will understand a lot better. And so that was one of the really first lessons that I learned. It may be really intuitive, um, but this was the case of working with um, someone from the United States who thought, well, everyone will understand English. Um, that may be different here uh, in Europe, but um, that was a, a very quick lesson that was learned as well too. Um, and going back, what we also learned as well, too, is that um, it's important to work with individuals, as you saw with the picture with the penguins. Um, it's really important to work with one or two people, um, to work on the computers that uh, they will work on, not necessarily in workshop. And so here is uh, two individuals. We were showing them a, um, a secure database tool, um, and we just spent some time uh, with them. Afterwards as well, too, as you saw, there's a group of people as well, too. So this is someone that we had trained uh, showing her colleagues as well, too. Um, what we've also done as well is we've worked with some universities as well to try to bring um, uh, students or professors uh, to, to, to meet and understand uh, uh, how some of the different organizations we work with, uh, what they do. Uh, so about two, almost three years ago now, um, I helped uh, advise uh, a professor from the University of Toronto and three of his students, and we filmed. Uh, they filmed a documentary in regards to um, you know what the situation is not only in Guatemala but in southern Mexico as well too. Uh, so here, uh, one of the the students uh, who now works with the the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto, um, I think was explaining um, a particular way to do disk encryption with OpenBSD uh, to um, some technical um, Linux experts in Guatemala. So as you can see, we, you know, it ranges from uh, using uh, presentations outside to really spending some time with people as well, too. Um, you saw some computers there. So when you talk about IT infrastructure, what is it that you find in the field? What is it that you find in countries that you visit that you want to help um, uh, organizations? So the, the first thing that we try to do, and we would suggest people to do as well, too, is just uh, when you visit an organization before you start, just tour around the organization and see what they have. And you'll see that in, in leading organizations, you might have um, things like this hanging from the wall. Um, there may be, uh, I think this was the case of the um, organization that has about 100 people, and they were using eight port hubs. And they said their internet was really slow. And um, some of the cables that were on the ground were like this. And so the internet might not work. It's just because you might have uh, water come on it. Uh, you might have uh, mice uh, eat the cables. And so one of the things to do is, you know, um, that's a real problem. But if also if it's a hub, as you know, if someone just connects um, to the hub, they can just listen to the whole traffic as well, too. So if you're talking about secure communications or se uh, security for this organization, uh, do you recommend that they all use VPNs, or do you recommend that they all switch to switches instead? Um, and so that's one of the things that, that one has to deal with. But again, organizations can have computers, um, and sometimes the, the biggest problem um, for some of the trainers, particularly when they come to other countries, um, like coming to Germany as well too, is that the keyboards 
um, might be very different. Uh, so I think that the biggest challenge was working on a Russian keyboard and an Arabic keyboard, also on a German keyboard, the keys are a little bit different. So if you have a password that you remember because of where the keys are on your keyboard, uh, they may not work when you go to, to other countries. Uh, in terms of, you saw some technology in terms of what are specific examples or specific things that we may have done. So there was a specific organization that had come under a threat because they had had their computer stolen three times uh, in the year. Um, they were working on documenting, um, uh, documenting uh, people who had been um, killed uh, 30 years earlier uh, by some military officials. So these were people that were going into the field that were recording testimonies of people who had witnessed things. They were bringing all that information to the office using their computers and putting on their computers. They would come into the office the next morning. Either the computers would be gone um, sometimes the filing cabinets were gone. Um, and then most, uh, and most recently is just the hard drives would be gone. And so they had no ways, they were just working on individual workstations. So this is an organization that had about 60 people working and they had a problem. They needed their information backed up. And so what do you do if you have an organization with uh, about 40 computers because uh, they're shared sometimes and they want to do a backup solution. And so this came to the attention of, of both us uh, as well as the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And it was um, thanks to the US organization who was working with this partner said, we really need to do something. Um, and they said, well, um, if they're backing up everything on their computers, uh, why don't we get, why don't we put them on a network, get a file server and do a tunnel to do a backup uh, using SSH, using rsync to back up um, all the information on a remote site. Sounds good, what do you need to do first? You need to build a network, uh, right? You need to get network cards, you need to wire, and you need to find people who can support them. And so this took about two months to plan, uh, to find the budget, what everything would cost. Um, and that's one of the challenges that you get. So what did that look like? So here's uh, the organization. Uh, we asked for volunteers in the organizations. We, we, we talked with the directors of the organization to say, who are employees that uh, are gonna stay with the organization for a long time, who people tend to go to for help, um, either with technology or other things. Uh, and they, they identified three individuals who um, have been around with the organization, who tend to do things all the time. And so we had our volunteers, and then we had to train them on how to build a network. So the first thing you have to do is not bring the cables, but we had to find where you could find PVC uh, and internet cables and crimping tools and source them locally um, at a cost that was far more expensive, but at least if we, had, if we needed extra cable, uh, we could find it locally. And then it was working with the, with the people of the organization to actually you know, do the hard work. This is before wireless was, was really being used. Um, and, probably still would recommend this, is build uh, an ethernet network with, with switches. Uh, so we had to help them with, with uh, you know, how to wire it, how the, the schematic, how the network would look like, uh, what type of cable to use, because we went to the, the hardware place and they of course wanted to sell us the, the cheapest cable. Uh, and we're like, no, we want category five, we want these things. So the specifications, some people might not know. These organizations might not have technical people. Um, they just will you know, know how to use Word or they may know how to use some other uh, tool. And so we really had to help them with some of the questions. But then they were very eager to build the network. Uh, here's someone um, with the PVC piping because part of the cable had to go outside. Uh, we had to drill holes everywhere, typical things that maybe a lot of you know how to do. Um, but these people or this organization didn't. And so we showed them in none of these pictures will you see that the foreigners doing it? It was the locals doing it, and that's a very important thing uh, and part of it. And you know, working together, uh, it was a long day, but even at the end of the day, they were, they were smiling, uh, still are smiling. And here you see one of the gentlemen uh, you know, crimping the, the, the cable, checking to make sure. And at the end of the day, I don't have a picture of the server, um, we asked them to go ahead and try to install Red Hat. And here the error is, uh, uh, the partition is in inconsistent. But they got it to this point, which was pretty good. But this took, to get to this point took three days. Because it was two stories, 
and uh, there were only three people, and we couldn't get all the supplies at once. So it, it takes time. And then what was the problem is then we had to find the server, the remote server, uh, where they could do their backup. Um, and then we found out that we couldn't get a fixed IP because Guatemala doesn't have an allocation of fixed IPs. And so then we had to do a tunnel first, uh, then so you could reach the machine through another machine in the United States because there's just not enough uh, static IPs. And if you wanted to get a static IP, it's an extra $500 a month, or it was at the time two years ago. And so it's, that was one of the problems. Um, over the course of the two years that they now have a backup solution, um, the, the backup server is now full. Um, and of course, um, because it was a remote site, um, you know, the server was full. You don't want to, you know, where do you put the server? Do you put it in someone's home? Do you put it in some organization? So it was with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, a known international organization they have a human rights program, or, or did at the time, but you know the 500 uh, gigabyte drive filled in two years, and so you know one of the expert technicians in the U.S. you know took a look inside the drive and why is this filled, and of course he found a lot of porn, uh, and a lot of MP3s, and so then it's the question is well we didn't tell the people at the beginning that they couldn't collect pictures, and it was backing up everything that they were installing on their computer, so someone had you know peer to peer programs and it was just doing a remote backup, and so. You know, in, in retrospect, then you have to think about that too. If you're putting a backup procedure in place and you're doing a remote backup, um, you know, what can you put in so you don't make a backup of people's porn? And then the problem was that it needed to be restored. Um, you know, luckily there were people, but that's the other thing is to do a backup is maybe simple, but how do you run it in reverse? What is it that needs to be installed on, on, on the Linux server so the person just goes, knows what to do? So having written instructions is very important. Um, and so one thing, I, I guess, mixing with the technology is that you saw there was cabling, um, you saw there are computers. One has to remember that, as I mentioned earlier, that these type of organizations, their primary job isn't IT, isn't computers, isn't security. Um, it's just working with, with human rights, and you'll see a picture of what that means. They collect some very important information, as I said, Witness testimonies. They'll collect information um, about uh, witnesses where they're being um, safely um, protected, but also uh, information about people who have died. Also forensic information. And they have to collect it. They have to keep not only the computer-generated information, but also the original source information as well, too. So when one talks about backing up data or protecting data, it's not just bits, it's not just ones and zeros, it's physical things too. So if one wants to help them is, um, you know, and those, you know, this is one organization in Guatemala that is a forensic anthropology. And so what they do is they go to the countryside when people from the countryside say, we found some bones. And they will go, they will dig up the bones, bring them for analysis to see, well, who are these people? Um, and this is something in Guatemala that there was a lot of massacres and people were buried in mass graves. And so then these bones get taken back, they get analyzed to see what was the cause of death. Um, and so they have a file on each individual, um, you know, pr particular characteristics. And when they find a skull, the skull might have a bullet hole. There might be a bullet. And then so if you have to accumulate all that information and protect it because together with the physical evidence that you might store, is then if you, if you then compile all the different uh, electronic data that you find, you might be able to build a case. And so one of the organizations, what they were doing is they did, I think it was over four or 500 exhumations, and they added this to, their uh, to um, a court case that they launched uh, to bring people to trial. And they can say, well, we know that this general was involved, he was in this area, and people died. And we know who the people were and we've done all the things. So this is what we're talking, you know, when we talk about human rights organizations in different countries, you know, this is the work. So it's, it's, it's a reality check to remember. Um, and again, this is Guatemala. And uh, the one thing I want to finish with is, um, I was just there two weeks ago, and um, I found um, um, there was an interesting thing that was uh, told to me, is that um, over the course of the last, uh, five years, uh, 10 years, um, and since 96, when there was the, the peace accords, 
um, there's been um, the, the population and a lot of the organizations and the human rights organizations that really want to uh, find out what happened during the, the, the years of, of, of the military dictatorship. And the first thing people ask is, well, we know the police were involved. Um, can we have access to the, to the police records? And the government, they don't exist. The records don't exist at all. And, you know, for, for 10 years, they would try to look, they would try to look, nothing would be found. And then just this May, um, at one of the military um, barracks, there was an explosion. And um, one of the, the government uh, investigators with the Human Rights Office said, let's go visit all the different places where they have military explosives, you know, to see what other things they might be hiding or not. And so they went to the first place where there was the explosion. They didn't say, let's find anything. But they said, oh, there's this other military dump in Guatemala City. Uh, you might want to go there. Um, so they did. And um, they found some interesting things. And I'll take you through some of the pictures. So uh, the, the place that they found was in a residential uh, part of Guatemala. Um, this is what kind of it looks like. Um, just outside the place that they went, um, there's a lot of police walking around, um, but it's a military compound, so it, it's fine. And as you see, and I'll translate this from, from the Spanish, it says, it's the service for the, the disactivation of explosives. So it was a, a munitions dump, and this is where they bring bombs and, and mines and other things to deactivate them. And outside you find, um, because it's a police thing, um, old police cars. Um, cars that have been impounded, um, you know, old vehicles. Um, you look at the out outside of the facility, and what does it look like? It looks like this. Um, not really in really good shape. Um, and the woman that was giving us the tour is there. Um, and so what happens is these, these, these government officials went to this place, um, they walked down these stairs, and where you see all the trash, they found stuff like this. Um, documents. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you a few pictures in a moment, but they started seeing that um, these are photocopies of national ID cards, um, documents that were either bound up or a lot of documents that were just piled everywhere. And what they had found is they had found the archive that they had been searching for for the last 10 years. And when they went through, um, they basically found out that almost all of the police archives from 1904 and to the present were being stored here. And uh, the first thing that they said is, uh, we need to protect this. And so they got a judicial order to make sure that the, um, you know, the police wouldn't want to destroy it. The second thing is they took a look and they invited some international experts. Um, and um, uh, there's an organization in the U.S. called the National Security Archive, known as the NSA, but they're the good NSA. Uh, and they, uh, they're involved in declassifying government documents. And so they work with a lot of organiz um, you know, they declassify U.S. government documents, but also with uh, archives around the world. And so they immediately call the, the people from the, um, NS the good NSA in the U.S., to say, look what we found, can you come and pay us a visit? So if you go to the, and I can show you the photos from the NSA, um, and they basically found, again, documents from 1904 to the present. Um, when they asked the, the women uh, who were working there, and there's about eight of them at the time, and still am and have always worked there, as they said, you know, how are these things organized? You know, we want to find out uh, what happened during this time period. They said, they were all organized according to year, what part of the country, and um, what police station it came from. That's how it's organized. And so you have a very big facility, that's how it's organized. And in terms of the pictures, uh, you know, you have one place you had eight inch disks. I hadn't seen them in, in years, so that was really interesting. No computers to read them, by the way, but you, you could see the eight inch disks. Um, piles and piles of documents everywhere. The problem was with the documents is that um, you know, some of them are nicely organized. Um, others are not. And as you can see in this place, um, well, you know, in a concrete structure, in a country that has a very nice rainy season, 
um, you saw the outside of the building. Well, what happens on the inside is, well, water will fall. Paper will rot. And um, so this was uh, two weeks ago. Apparently in, in May, uh, things were a lot worse. Uh, in this photo, um, you probably see like a little black object uh, towards the middle top. Looks like a little small window. So this is a room that, we, uh, that they showed us. And I immediately took a picture because the moment we opened the door, um, all these bats flew out of the room. And so, you know, these are rooms that aren't really kept in really good conditions to save documents. There's water, there's animals. Um, apparently they had fumigated so that there weren't any rats, but, but just documents everywhere. And so um, this is a group of the people who, um, they had taken one of the rooms, um, I painted it, um, cleaned it up, and you know, they're still afraid that these documents might disappear. And so, because it's still owned by the police, but there's a judicial order to protect it, um, these people, there's always, between the different organizations, there's always people that actually sleep there. And in case anything happens, they all have cell phones, and they can immediately phone you know, their colleagues. Uh, but they're also working to go through all the documents, because apparently, um, the estimate is that there are 75 million pages of documents, none of which are really cat uh, categor um, there's a catalog or an index. So the big challenge is, can you digitize this? And so one of the questions a lot of the organizations are asking is, how is it that you could digitize this? How much it would cost and who could do it? And so organizations like uh, uh, from the Internet Archive and other organizations are being asked as well, well, what is it that you can do to help this? And when I, um, when I was shown this two weeks ago and I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm coming to Berlin to this, to this conference with some people that might be interested, you know, what is it that I can, the message that I can tell people about, you know, your situation? I said, you just tell them about it. We want people to know. And if there's anything that they can help just um, to know about it because, you know, the government can take it away from us. And if there's any experience in regards to a lot of government documents that get found um, and what people do with them, um, it would be a good idea. I don't think the person had a context in terms of, you know, if we're talking about Berlin in terms of, you know, mysterious government documents that suddenly appear, um, well, you know, the, 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 the Stasi files come to mind. And so um, if anyone here had experience in terms of digitizing them, in terms of categorizing them, there are people in other parts of the world that, that, that are interested in this because it's how you can share your experience here with them. And so um, that's the connection a little bit with, uh, with Berlin. And so I want to wrap up because I want to take some uh, questions as well. Is just a couple of things in terms of some of the lessons that we've learned. Some of them I've mentioned in them already. Is to really keep the explanation simple. Uh, to really get to the core message and um, make sure they understand that. Not that whether they should use RSA versus DSA. <laughs> it's that they should use encryption. So that's important and to explain things in a very illustrative fashion. It, it helps a great deal. In, in regards to secure communications tool, um, there's a lot of tools. Everyone's been, knows about GNU PG, PGP. They've been using it for a long time. But, you know, I've had an experience of showing people for four years. It's a really great tool. You ask people three months later, are they still using it? And they go, no. Why? It's too difficult. And so when that's the problem, um, you know, what do people do? Well, depending on what platform they use, is sometimes they um, only encrypt the message but not the attachment. Sometimes the plugins don't work, but sometimes the subject lines um, reveal what the, the message is. And so the tools have to get a lot easier. Um, but the other thing, too, is uh, to remember um, Ellison's law, which, mean, which is that the user base for strong cryptography declines by half by each additional keystroke or mouse click that's required. And so what you really need to do is something that opportunistically encrypts, something that just occurs behind the scenes. Um, if you're installing an operating system, if people are being shown how to use uh, bootable Linux, uh, um, uh, Nopix, or, or, or other things, is to make sure all these things are built in and turned on. Uh, because the moment they have to install something, um, it just not, may not be installed. Or if they have to always click on something, they'll forget. So it just has to occur behind the scenes. So the transport layer stuff is very important. Um, but also, if you're showing them new things, is they might have problems. 
And so they have to be able to blame someone or they have to be able to get help. And so whatever you, you show people, you have to keep that in mind. That you, know, you have to, you know, a lot of people say, well, just get everyone to use uh, Linux. You know, that's a really good thing, but if there's no one in the country who knows Linux and you show them how to use Linux and they have a problem, they'll just uninstall Linux and install Windows again. And so maybe the thing is to find people who can train them with Linux and then when they're ready, slowly move them over. And so there's some organizations that do that. We, we don't do that, but others do. Um, what, I, what I put that is dependency on foreigners is a bad thing. Um, so they should be able to do it themselves. Um, again, not only do we need good crypto, but we need usable crypto that's very, very important and needs to be turned on. Um, I'll finish with, uh, with this slide and two pictures. Is um, the reason I'm excited that everyone's here, I hope it's not because of the next presentation, but I hope it's because people are here, is that uh, something that, um, that Frank mentioned yesterday in um, his talk on We Lost the War, um, a positive thing is that we have to try to bring different communities together. And so that's something that we've tried to do with the human rights community and we, haven't, we should not give up. We should just re, uh, join forces and maybe having a larger army behind us, uh, we can try to go forward. Um, and I'll finish with, uh, with two things. One of them is a poem uh, that really illustrates this. Um, it's, uh, it's not the desire of justice, the hope of peace, um, the love of a woman, or the tenderness of a guitar. It's the heart of solidarity that brings us together today. And so everyone's here. Um, for this talk and maybe to the Congress because they have particular things um, that they share. And you know the, the, that, that sense of community should not be lost and should really be built on. Um, so two things, um, and this is something in, in Spanish, it shows a community and it says the democracy is work of everyone. So we all have to work together. Um, you know, Frank said yesterday that there's maybe people in companies or maybe law enforcement who we've known that we've lost contact with. Well, we really need to work with, with everyone together, and it's really important. Um, and here's the, uh, the poem that you saw. Uh, this is outside of a, a bar in Guatemala City um, that was translated. So again, um, I thank everyone uh, for the talk. I have, I think, about hmm, maybe three or four minutes. Um, there weren't, I took some questions earlier. Are there any questions or, or comments people might have now? And if not, I'll be available as well. Any questions? Any questions going once? There are, there are two microphones. Well, again, I, I thank everyone. I'll be available afterwards if anyone has any comments. So again, thank you for listening to my talk.